Hello everybody, how are you doing today? I hope you're having a good day. It's another day the Lord has made and we've had a couple rainy days and we got a little sunshine right now, but it's supposed to rain some more this week and can't complain about that. We certainly need it here. So um, anyway, I hope your day is going well. I know some of you probably having to deal with storms and ice and snow and uh, nasty weather, but some of you down south, uh, you're enjoying sunshine. Maybe it's a little too hot for you. I don't know. We just have to make the best of what we have and uh, always remember our responsibility and duty towards God. So speaking of that, our, our lesson today is called the fine line between obedience and disobedience. And it seems like a lot of people want to know exactly where that line is so they can get as close to it as they can without crossing that line. And with that type of attitude, they've already crossed that line. So we're, we're, we're going to notice this, and we're going to notice the character in the Old Testament. We're going to look at King Saul. And we have the story in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 24. Now, I'm not going to read it all, and some of you are very familiar with this story. But anyway, God made Saul king and said, now here's what I want you to do. And verse 3 says, now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And he took, and he, he, so he went. Saul went, they, he took battle up against the Amalekites and he killed most of them. But we're going to see that all of a sudden his obedience turned to disobedience. In verse 8, it says, And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, and of the fatlings and the lambs, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, they, they destroyed utterly. All right, well, okay. He did what he was supposed to do, right? Well, he just made a little bit of an adjustment. Well, that, that's, that's the problem. He made that adjustment, and he did not do what he's supposed to do. In verse 10, then, then came the word of Jehovah to Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. <clears throat> I mean, somebody might want to sit there and argue, oh, but he did. He went and destroyed the Amalekites. Uh, he just uh, made one slight adjustment to what his command was. But God says, he has not performed my commandments. And so Samuel was wroth, and he cried unto Jehovah all night. In verse 13, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of Jehovah, I have performed the commandment of Jehovah. Well, Samuel said, Then what meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Okay, immediately Saul said, Uh-oh. <laughs> he, he knew what he had done. He knew he didn't do what he was supposed to do, and so he started making excuses. And he, he, he tried to shift the blame, <clears throat> but really, let's face it, with the king, the buck stops here. I mean, he, he was one in charge, and he should have told them. But anyway, verse 15, Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. And I guess he was thinking he can get on Samuel's good side. He says, So that they could sacrifice unto Jehovah your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. I mean, so... so you, you know, he's like a lot of people today when, when, when they're approached by something that they're failing to do, that they either shift the blame or try and twist it to where it makes them look okay. And people do that all the time. Verse 19 says, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of Jehovah, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst that which was evil in the sight of Jehovah? Verse 20, And Saul said, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone the way which Jehovah sent me, and I have brought back Agag, king of Amalekite, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. 
And then he continues on with this, but the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, chief of the devoted things, to sacrifice unto Jehovah as great, uh, and, and uh, Je Jehovah thy God in Gilgal. Verse 22, and Samuel said, hath Jehovah as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord, or Jehovah? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. See, this is where a lot of people get into trouble these days. He, he went on to explain in verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry and teraphim. Because thou hast rejected the word of Jehovah, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And then verse 24, Saul, okay, Saul, you got me. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of Jehovah and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. See, here, here, here's the problem with a lot of people today. that they, they, they rely upon what people think of them rather than what God thinks of them. So these lessons we, we, we learn and we see quickly how obedience turns to disobedience. He did some of what he was supposed to do. Probably we could say most of what he was supposed to do, but he didn't do all of what he was supposed to do. And folks, that's where the lesson is. A lot of people feel they can do most of what God says or even some of what God says and think they're okay, but they're not doing all of what God says. You know, Peter stood before the council in Acts 5, 29 and said, uh, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And that's true. We should not fear the people. We should see what God expects of us to do and then do it and not fear if the people are going to be in approval or not. Because in our world today, people are not in approval of anything that God suggests, anything that God puts forward as how, how you're supposed to do things. I mean, that, yeah, they still like the idea of being kind to your fellow man and treating your fellow man properly, but they're trying to do it without God. And the, the writer in Ecclesiastes basically taught trying to do anything without God is vanity. And so that's why we have to impress upon people the fact that obedience is necessary for salvation. There's people out there teaching that it doesn't matter if you obey God or not. He's, he's such a loving God, he's going to save everybody. Well, that's not true because that would basically invalidate most of what the Bible says. I mean, God holds people accountable for their actions. And he, he, in the Old Testament, they were held accountable for their actions. And in the New Testament, they, they we're still taught we're going to be held accountable for our actions. See, the subject of obedience on man's part is a major theme that runs throughout the Bible. I mean, without obedience, man is lost eternally. See, in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, it says about Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And so Christ learned obedience through the things which he suffered, and because of that, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? To those who only do part of what he says, or to obey him? I mean, that, that, that word, to obey Jesus, is implying everything Jesus taught us. A lot of people are just comfortable just taking a few things that Jesus said and going with that and holding to that and just ignoring the rest of what Jesus said. And that's not going to help any soul get to heaven. And we want people to go to heaven. That's why we make the effort to try and teach. We, we teach on this forum here, uh, on Facebook and YouTube. We teach on this forum because we want to help people get to heaven. And we want them to see the reality of what God says and not rely upon what's in their feelings or what someone has told them. So, like we say, there's a fine line between obedience and disobedience. We see that Saul did most of what he was told to do, yet God was not pleased and repented that he had made Saul king. That's what we read. And the general teaching in modern times is that if we do even some of what God says, we'll be just fine. 
I mean, believe on the Lord. That's all you have to do. So a lot of people teach that. Well, yes, belief is necessary. There's no question about it. We have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross for our sins. We have to believe that, and that is necessary. But then what we're taught through this faith, which we have, is that we're supposed to be obedient. I mean, Romans talks 1.5 talks about the obedience of faith. In other words, faith tells us and dictates this is what God wants, and our faith motivates us to do what God wants. See, there, there's, it's just one thing to say you believe in God. It's another thing to demonstrate it through your actions. And so uh, we, we learn these things, and we're reminded Romans 15, 4, that the things written beforehand were written for our learning. Through patience and hope, we might be able to gain the victory. And, and so that's what we're supposed to. We're supposed to learn from these things. And we see that Saul immediately took his army and went and battled against the Amalekites like God had told him to do. But he didn't follow through all the way and complete what God had told him to do. And that's where a lot of people are these days. That, that's the way they, they behave. That's the way they live. And they're, they're still, they're deluding themselves because they think, well, I've done some good things. Uh, I'm okay with God now. But it doesn't work that way. See, Romans 6, 15 through 18. Paul wrote, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves as servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. All right, so now we can go through the motions and do everything perfectly, as possible as we can, and yet still have to face that fine line. See, God spoke through Isaiah that the people honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. And Jesus report, repeated this quote, Matthew 15 and verse 8. A lot of people just go through the motions. See, you can actually go to church, sing the songs, pray, observe the Lord's Supper, and contribute of your means, listen to the lesson, and greet everybody and tell everybody you love them. And yet, if your heart's not in it, if you would rather be somewhere else, it tells God that your heart is not into worshiping him with our whole heart. So many times we, we get sidetracked. We start thinking about our friends and our parties and, and uh, the fun we're going to have. We're thinking about the ball game. We're thinking maybe about the, the dinner in the oven that we, we might be cooking or, some, or where we're going to go eat. If we're not totally focused on God and worshiping him, our heart's not in it. See, many in the Old Testament were warned to seek God with their whole heart, to honor God with their whole heart, to serve God with their whole heart. And the truth is that serving God with our whole heart is still expected of everyone today. And so we, we learn that. And we also are warned in the scriptures that disobedience brings punishment. See in James 2 verses 8 through 11 it says, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. I mean, so, so that, that, that's so important there. <clears throat> Whoever keeps the whole law and yet offends in one point, you become guilty of the law. And I think a lot of people don't like that idea. They, they think that grace will kind of... Uh, smooth that over so it doesn't matter if you sin from time to time. 
Folks, it does matter if we sin. We should be aware of our sin, and we're supposed to pray on a constant basis, pray without ceasing. Why? Because, yeah, we're human. We're fallible. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. So we need to ask God for forgiveness. And we might go through a whole day not doing anything that God would call a sin. And what do we do when we lay our head on our pillow? First words out of our mouth are usually, forgive me of my sins. And we need our sins forgiven so that God will hear our prayers. And so that's what we always do. And we should continue that practice because we, we, we never know when we might make a mistake. The psalmist in Psalm uh, 19 mentions the fact that protect me from my secret sin. Sometimes we don't know we've sinned. We've done something that we didn't know was wrong. We weren't aware of it. And so we need to be asking forgiveness for those sins as well. We need to be very concerned about willful sins. You know, Hebrews 10, 26 says, if you continue sin willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice. I, I think that's a very scary passage. I think it's one that people ought to look at very carefully. If you think, well, I'll just go ahead and sin and then I'll ask for forgiveness later. Folks, you're not promised that later will come. And so we have to be aware of that. All right. So in our duty towards God, in spite of all the exhorting and encouraging that is done, there are some that are very indifferent about the attendance and the work associated with the church. You can tell that because the evidence speaks volumes. I mean, if all they do, if they don't care about learning more about God, they're not going to show up for the Bible classes. And I'm not talking about those who have... Uh, age-related difficulties or sickness-related. Some people cannot sit in a place for two hours. So I'm not talking about those kind of people, but people who have the ability. I mean, they'll go in and sit in the movie theater for two and a half, three hours. They'll go to a sporting event, sit there for three or four hours. And they'll do that, but the one hour of church, that becomes a burden to them. All right, so, I mean... That's, what we're, that's who we're talking about. They become indifferent about the attendance. And if they're a family, the parents are teaching their children, church is not important. It's just one of those options. It's an optional. I mean, that, that's how a lot of people treat the assemblies. Well, if I make it to church one time, I've done my duty to God and I'll be okay. Folks. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is basically enjoined upon every one of us. And we ought to know that. We ought to do it because we love the Lord. We ought to be here because we enjoy singing praise to God. We enjoy learning more about serving God and helping others to find God, to be able to edify one another. We should have enjoyment with that. But for some people, that's a drudgery. And that shows, and of course, God knows their hearts. See, doing good works. I mean, that, that's something we can do, and we should be doing it. Ephesians 2.10 says we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, that God planned beforehand that we should do them. Titus 1.3, remind them to be ready for every good work. Later on in chapter 2, it says zealous for good works. I mean, the people of God, the true people of God are zealous for good works. The people who aren't true people of God, they don't care about doing good works. And 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so if we don't do these things, it becomes sin for us. Why? Because they're good works. And James 4, 17, to him that knoweth to do good and does not, to him it is sin. So we're commanded to do good. And if we do not do the good that has been commanded, we have become disobedient. And we, almost, we also must point out that doing good works does not make up for the bad things that we are doing or the disobedience we're guilty of. See, there's not really a balance scale where you do a lot of good works, you kind of outweigh the bad you've done. See, if we have sin, no matter how small, that will separate us from God both now and eternally. That's why we need to ask God for forgiveness all the time because we can't take that chance. 
Now, some people teach that, oh yeah, don't worry, grace covers that. Well, folks, there's a fine line there. How? I mean, how many sins can you get away with before all of a sudden God says that's enough? I mean, we, if we break it down, one sin is enough to keep one out of heaven, then, then we're on the right track. That means we've got to be very careful not to sin. And that's what we're commanded in 1 John 2 and verse 1. Command you not to sin, but if you do sin, you have that advocate. So yeah, we're human. We know we're going to make mistakes, but, it, but we know we also have Christ to pray to and, and God to pray to through Christ. Yeah, forgive me of my sins. And we can do that. So there, there's not that balance scale that some people want to try and picture that, okay, if I do some good, that'll make up for all the bad that I've done. And folks, it doesn't work that way. I mean, our only hope is to do our repentance and confession of sin so that Christ's blood will take our sins away. Initially, that happens when we obey the gospel. Our sins are washed away in baptism, Acts 22 and verse 16. And then after that, when we confess our sins to God and pray to God, then he'll forgive us of our sins, 1 John 1 and verse 9. So to those who think they can change or ignore one of God's laws and thereby still gain the promised reward, they're badly mistaken. God has told us what he wants. He doesn't want us to modify it or adjust it or change it. And sadly, many people in this world have done that. I mean, the requirements God has for us, pe people have even tried to change that. All right, so God promises to render wrath upon those who do not know God and those who do not keep his commandments. And like I said, keeping his commandments, we're not talking about some of his commandments or most of his commandments. We're talking about all of his commandments. And so whenever we say keeping his commandments, that should be understood to mean all of them, not just some of them. See, obedience is required in every facet of our lives. I mean, obedience to God should be there. I mean, it's not like, okay, we walk out the building, church building, and we turn off God, and then we live like the world until next Sunday. No, it's not that way at all. We're supposed to be Christians 24-7, 365. 365 and a quarter if you want to be technical. But still, we're supposed to be Christians all the time. And when we start playing with the world and being friends with the world, we, we realize we're making ourselves enemies of God and God's not happy. That's James 4 and verse 4. So the King Saul learned that only doing a part of what God commanded was not good enough. And we should learn that lesson also. We should learn the same lesson, learn God's ways and his commandments, and learn what those commandments are and do them all. See, a lot of people, they won't even pick up their Bible and learn what the commandments are. And so, yeah, God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, Hosea 6 and verse 4. Um, so, yes, this requires a study of God's word. I think this should have been Hosea 4, 6. <laughs> okay, but still, learn what the commandments are and do them all. Yes, this requires a study of God's word to learn what his commandments for us are, and then we need to do that. I mean, if our heart's not in the right place, we've transgressed that line. A lot of people want to see how where that line is between obedience and disobedience, and they want to stay and travel right along that line. And if, if that's their attitude, they don't realize they're already on the wrong side. And, and so, uh, learn there is a difference. Not doing all of what God says crosses that line, and not having your heart into serving God properly crosses that line, and trying to see how close you can get to that line basically crosses that line by itself. So think about these things, and like I said, there's a fine line between obedience and disobedience. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves on the wrong side. That's why we need to pray and ask God to help us out because we need his help. All right, think about these things. And Lord willing, we'll be back with another message. Bye-bye for now.